Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, I work uh, in this building. Um, so I started uh, out in my life as a, a physicist, as an undergraduate, um, and I have had a pretty interdisciplinary career. Uh, my PhD work was in cognitive psychology. I had people study lists of words and recall them. And uh, more recently, I've been working uh, closely with um, uh, neuroscientists on, on, on a variety of things. And looking back over um, my time, I think um, what I'm trying to do is something that uh, the great condensed matter physicist Philip Anderson uh, described long ago in uh, this science paper, which I encourage everyone to have a look at. Um, so Anderson was reacting to the idea that psychology is just applied biology. And biology is just applied chemistry and chemistry is just applied and you can go on down to like high energy physics. And he was arguing that you should really have separate theories at separate levels and that they, they're different subjects, more is different. Um, and over um, my career in uh, neuroscience and psychology, I've come to believe that um, there actually ought to be something in between cognitive psychology and neuroscience, that um, we need to have some set of equations, some set of theory that enables us to map simultaneously between behavior mediated by cognitive models of how we you know, have reaction times and accuracy and stuff like that, and then describing populations of many, many neurons cooperating without really worrying about how those uh, those equations come into uh, being. Uh, and if you were able to do that, you'd have equations you could take seriously. And this is the, this is the, the sort of Rosetta Stone that enables like theoretical physics to work. You take the equation seriously, you grind the crank, you see what comes out. So um, about a decade ago, we wrote down some stuff uh, about uh, a hypothesis about how you could make sense of cognitive models of many different forms of memory, short-term memory, episodic memory conditioning, um, and uh, those equations uh, predicted uh, the following phenomenon, which we've now observed really well, uh, 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 including pioneering work here at uh, Boston University from uh, Howard Eichenbaum and Mike Castlemo and uh, many others as well. Um, there's this um, uh, uh, phenomenon called time cells, which I predict many of you are familiar with, and I have four minutes, so we're gonna go really fast. Uh, when something interesting happens, like there's a clap and it recedes into the past. Uh, it seems that uh, the stimulus triggers sequences of uh, cells uh, firing in the hippocampus, but also prefrontal cortex, also striatum, also uh, many, many, many brain regions, not just the hippocampus, uh, that enable you to recover what happened when in the past, right? Uh, and these sequences go on for at least a minute uh, and uh, perhaps longer and uh, consistent with the predictions uh, of uh, those equations we wrote down many years ago. Um, and there's an equation you can take seriously that comes from all this. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a picture of Gustav Fechner, uh, who uh, uh, gave us the Weber-Fechner law, which hopefully uh, comes up in a moment. Um, uh, the Weber-Fechner law basically says that um, uh, uh, internal scales that describe physical uh, things out in the world uh, are on a log scale. And that's why we understand loudness in decibels and why the octaves on a piano are, you know, a doubling of lag, but they sound evenly spaced. Um, and we hypothesize as part of that, uh, as part of that uh, conjecture, uh, that, um, uh, that time ought to behave the same way, that our internal scale for time ought to be logarithmically compressed as well, following decades and decades and decades of work in psychology. Uh, and I'm gonna point you at this paper uh, from uh, Ray, who's right there, and uh, 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 using data from uh, the uh, Eichenbaum lab with uh, guidance from Mike, um, uh, demonstrating that, we, that it seems that hippocampal uh, time cells obey exactly that equation uh, from uh, Weber Fechner uh, way back in the day. Okay, we have to do this really fast. Okay, so what could we do if we had equations we could take seriously? Well, we could build artificial neural networks that use those equations and what properties would those things have? So here's a thought experiment. Let's do auditory MNIST. Three, you have to write out three. Four, you write out four. I say six, six. I say, okay, now watch this. Seven. All right, what letter was that? And if you got it right, you're smarter than a neural network that does not use logarithmically compressed time. So we built out a, a deep neural network uh, where each layer is just a set of logarithmically compressed time cells. There's weights that learn in between so that what changes from one layer to the next. Okay, um, uh, and uh, so what might go from phonemes to words to sentences to ideas as you uh, traverse this uh, level? Um, but the, the more kind of amazing result is that after you train at one speed, seven, uh, you can then, without retraining the network, generalize to 
arbitrarily uh, wide uh, uh, speeding up and slowing down. So uh, artificial neural networks with these properties are great and uh, the end. Okay. <laughs>